Welcome to the Rural Water Resource Management course, week one, lecture two. Today, we would be looking at the different points of the hydrological cycle and why it is important for understanding to manage India's rural water resources. So, importance of water resource management in India hydrological soil cycle and representations. Let's look at this water cycle or the hydrological water cycle. USGS from the US stands for US Geological Survey. And they've done a very comprehensive uh, representation of a hydrological cycle. Please understand that this has been done for the US region but most of it would still apply for Indian context. If you look at uh, major hydrological components, soil research, etc., we still follow the US norms. So that is why I'm using the representation of US geological survey. So let's start here. In this entire cycle, okay, we could start anywhere and it has to come back to the starting point. So for convenient purpose, let's start with the atmosphere. In the atmosphere, we have clouds, which convert or condense water into precipitation, right? So it has a couple of different formats, but uh, we will go through that when we look at each component in depth in the coming weeks. So let's say one type of precipitation is rainfall, so water from water vapor from the clouds convert into precipitation, then it hits the land and converts into runoff. So you could see here that some permafrost and, and snow are also being uh, converted into runoff, which is basically uh, water moving on the land. And you could uh, see precipitation flowing into the rivers as runoff. Okay. Whenever the arrow comes down, it means it is going from top with the atmosphere to the ground. And whenever it is an up uh, direction, it is coming from a lower potential to uh, a different potential or from the ground to, in this case, from the ground uh, into the um, rivers and lakes. So some of the water gets infiltrated and moves into the groundwater. And within the groundwater, you have multiple directions, one goes in as a deep aquifer or deep groundwater, and then there is some for shallow groundwater. Then what happens is some of the runoff converts into rivers and then gets stored as lakes, ponds, etc. So you could see some of them being stored, but some do manage to come, come out of any storage units and then come back to oceans. When it comes to the oceans, please understand after some time, it does evaporate. So that is uh, captured by this term. So as I said, it goes from the land to the atmosphere by the top arrow. So you could see that evaporation happens and all these fresh water gets converted back into water vapor and then clouds. So this is how a simple cycle I've explained, but we will go into depth in each component which is relevant to India and especially Indian rural regions. So when we talk about rural regions, we would uh, eventually uh, do not consider volcanic steam, ice, snow, glaciers, permafrosts, et cetera, because most of the rural regions in India is going to be arid or semi-arid, which means not uh, that much snowfall, or I would say even zero snowfall probability, okay? So most of the agriculture, uh, can be using snow water melt, which is coming from here, down, for example, into the Bihar regions, uh, the Ganges uh, has a lot of snow melt com uh, composition. But uh, we would, uh, as a land hydrological process, we would look into what are the driving forces, driving um, parameters here. Please understand that 
All this is there, but we also have a sun. Why would the sun be there? Because in the water cycle, it is one of the most important drivers. All this would shut down if there is no evaporation. For example, let's take uh, two components which are very, very important here, which is precipitation, which is conversion of your cloud material into uh, the water vapor into a uh, liquid phase and comes to the ground. So that is your precipitation. And then the second part is your evaporation or evapotranspiration. So if your precipitation doesn't happen, there is no water on the land. Everything is in the cloud. Same thing, if evaporation, transpiration do not happen, then the water is stuck on the ground. For example, the oceans would be full of water and no water trans uh, evaporates up and the plants do not transpire water back into the atmosphere. So the cycle would be stopped. So this cycle is driven by your sun. If the sun shuts down, there is no evaporation. If there's no evaporation, there's no water vapor forming clouds. Uh, and the cycle of uh, sun and moon also helps in cooling down and condensing the water vapors. So the precipitation will not happen if there's no sun. And all of it would be one phase, which means the cycle would be stopped. Whatever water remains in the ground would be there. It will not evaporate. And there is no plant life, et cetera, et cetera. So that is why they have put the sun in this uh, picture very, very carefully. So this is a very general representation of a hydrological cycle. We would get into the details, as I said, on each component, which is necessary for rural India. Before that, let's look at how much water is there, how much fresh water is there uh, for the world uh, and then for India so that we have a context. We have to build a context like, yes, I've seen cycle, the water cycle, the different components, but how much, how much is it there for human consumption or uh, human related like food, agriculture, uh, drinking water, etc. It will be a very uh, interesting factor. That's why if we know how much we have, uh, we get to understand that the importance of water resource management as the title of the slide suggests. Let's take the water, total water. What you see here is around 97.5% uh, of the total world water is in oceans. Oceans, seas, all the salt water, okay? So all of this is saline water or salt in high in salt content, which is not usable. So that would not consider as a fresh water. Fresh water do not, does not have that much salinity. Uh, so if you look at it, only 2.5% of the total water in the world is fresh water. Plants do not grow on ocean water, please understand. Uh, humans do not consume it without a high intensive treatment like desalination plants. So it is important to understand that of the hydrological cycle, we're only looking at 2.5% of fresh water to manage. So it is very, very important to manage this 2.5%. And even the 2.5%, not all is usable. Let's break it down. So of the 2.5% of the fresh water, 80%, almost 80%, 79%, is locked in ice caps and glaciers. So what you see uh, as glaciers and ice caps moving in the Antarctic, Arctic is all fresh water because it is snow, ice. When you, when you melt it, you can drink it or after purification, but it is not readily usable. Okay? So the readily usable is only the remaining 21% of which 20% is groundwater which is under the ground and there are different stratifications. So right now, all the groundwater is put into this pool of 20%. Not all the groundwater is easily accessible. Very, very a subtle amount, uh, a very small amount is accessible. Let's get into the details of that when we talk about groundwater. However, of the 21%, which is easily or, or relatively easily accessible. 1% is easily accessible as surplus water, okay? 
and of the surface water that 1%, 52% is easily accessible surface uh, fresh water, which is your lakes, ponds, um, your big, big rivers, dams, etc, etc. So all these water that you see, for example, in, in Ganges, Nile, uh, Yamuna, everything would contribute to 52% or across the world, I'm saying. This is not for India, again, this is for the world. Of the 1%, 38% is in soil moisture, which is the water which is held in the soil, which is readily accessible to the plants. So understand that the soil moisture is a key component for plant growth and for living organisms in the soil. So the soil moisture, which is held in the soil, the water particles, water molecules that are held in the soil is around 38%. The remaining is atmospheric water vapor, rivers, water within living organisms, etc. So if you combine all this, we get around uh, one percent of fresh, uh, easily accessible water, of the two point five percent. Now I'm going up. Okay, so all this is one percent of the two point five percent. Okay, and of the two point five percent of the global water. So you have a very very small component. This water is salty, and in oceans, again, there has to be a process by which the salt water from the oceans convert to water vapor, which is driven by your sun evaporation, and then comes back down. Not all of the ocean water is evaporated, right? Uh, there's only limited amount of evaporation happening, limited clouds. Uh, so you don't see all the water in the oceans evaporate. Even fresh water is locked. Please understand this. It's a very important point. Even though we have 2.5%, not all the water is readily accessible. Easily accessible is a very small portion, very small, as I said, 1% of the 2.5% of the total water. See the numbers now. So 20, to, uh, 20 plus 1% is the total water available, easily available of the 2.5%, which are 0.5% of the total water volume. I'm pulling down groundwater here also because in recent years, the access to groundwater has increased. Because of scientific technologies, there's a lot of pumping that happens and a lot of uh, new innovations in pumps, cheaper cost, uh, cost uh, effective pumps have come to the market. So a lot of people are easily accessing groundwater. Is it sustainable? That's a different question. We will come to that when we talk about the rural water management. It is not sustainable, uh, but still uh, in this context of the slide, how much water is available? How much can we access? So if you do the numbers, 20 plus 1% of the 2.5% is accessible. Uh, I'm putting all the groundwater, which is approximately still only approximately 0.5% of the total water, which is a very, very small component. So it is very important to manage water. Let's look at uh, the numbers as a table. So if you have 100% uh, total water, you have 96.5% uh, locked in the oceans, seas, and bays. Uh, ice caps, as I said, the, the solid uh, ice water, uh, which is locked glaciers and permanent snow, you cannot access. The groundwater is around 1.7% of the total water. You would see some differences between FAO's uh, estimations in the previous slide and some people, some scientists um, estimations here, but almost they agree in terms of the volumes. So the percentages might be just a little bit off, but uh, it is almost the same. How much water is easily accessible is very, very small. Okay. So of the groundwater, uh, 0.76 uh, percentage um, is fresh water and then of the total water and saline. So it's not all the groundwater that is usable, as I said in the previous slide. Okay, then you have the soil moisture, which is very, very small given for the plants to consume. 
uh, and then you have groundwater lakes and even the lakes have bad quality water which is saline which is not potable so only fresh water is very small okay so if you look at the numbers um, even lakes uh, and rivers 0002 uh, of the total water volume is very, very small. So if you add up all these numbers, 0.76 in the groundwater, uh, 0 .007, 0 0.002 uh, in the uh, rivers, it approximates to around 0.5%. So uh, this is the difference between the estimates. In the here we had 0.5% approximately, here we have around 0 0.7877 7 percentage. But still, again, it's a very small volume of water at an annual scale. So it is very important to store it. Because of this, what has happened? Uh, this picture from WRI shows where the water stress is high, where it could be very, very high in the near future. Okay, so this is the baseline water stress. You could see that India and all the uh, countries along the equator with a higher temperature regime are facing extreme water stress. Also, those regions which have agriculture as the major crop uh, or livelihood uh, will see will have a lot of water stress. Okay, this also shows a high contrast between developing nations, underdeveloped nations, for example, here in Asia, and then uh, developing nations like India, and highly developed nations like US and Europe, etc. You could see that there is a stark difference in the water stress. Are they managing the water well? What are they doing different? This is very important to understand before we jump into the management of water. Well, the water stress is not the same across countries. This is this needs to be understood. Okay, so even though we have the similar rainfall patterns, similar temperature regimes, we have different water stress. Why is that? Why is this disparity in water? Because of how a nation uses the water, how uh, a country characterizes the water use. Let's take the world example. The world, 70% is of the water is given in agriculture. This is the average. Okay. And 20% is used in industry and 8% for domestic. So the human consumption is very, very small. On the whole, agriculture takes more water. This is the average world across the world. So if you come to low and middle income countries or low or uh, underdeveloped and developing nations, India comes in this ranking also, you would see that if, if 100 liters of water is there, India would spend approximately 82 liters on agriculture, whereas 10% is given to industry and 8% for domestic. So the 8% is still almost the same. Okay, So we are not going above and below. But if you look at where does the water, most of the water goes, it goes into agriculture. Most importantly, it goes above the world average. So if the average is 70%, still this low and middle income countries are pushing a lot of water into agriculture. And the agricultural produce does not get that much price. On the other hand, if you look at high income countries like the US, Australia, Europe, you would see most of the water is used for industrial applications, cars, um, computer technologies, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas 11% is domestic. So they have a higher quality of life. So they would have higher access to water, almost double. So their quality of life, how they, they use water resources is pretty high. So they will have a higher consumption, which is okay. But if you look at the agriculture, they're very, very, small compared to the average and the high and low middle income countries. This clearly shows where the priorities are. So for low and middle income countries, it is agriculture where they put a lot of effort and water into agriculture. Whereas in high and uh, high income countries, developed countries, the water is put in industry. 
And because of this, maybe the industrial produce is getting much, much higher benefits, economic benefits compared to agricultural produce, right? And that is one of the reasons maybe the high income countries are still high income countries and low and mid income countries are still getting poorer and poorer by day because the agricultural produce is not getting the price. There's climate change impacts on agricultural produce. Uh, there's losses, whereas in industry, it's almost the same. Okay, you, you are kind of mitigated against climate change. So this is the reason why we see this water stress being different in different countries. It is not only the population, it is also the livelihood. The population is very less, but then the livelihood of uh, options of the people where the water is spent is very, very important. Let us compare the water, but before that, the most important part, when we start the hydrological cycle, when we want to do these kind of, um, different uh, percentages, we need to calculate water. And while accessing these data, please note the units. Units are very, very important in, um, in this research. Okay, so when you do hydrological cycle, you, as we saw in the hydrological cycle, there are multiple parameters, multiple variables, multiple compartments of water, and each one would have a different unit. It's very important to bring all the units into one, which is normalize it, and so that we understand how much is rainfall, how much is groundwater, how much is stream water, the domestic use, etc. So please look into this uh, carefully. So for example, let's take some examples. Rainfall uh, are always measured as depths or rates. Depth as a thickness. So when you go to the news, they'll say, um, we had rainfall around 15 millimeters uh, over the monsoon, okay? So 15 millimeters is a thickness. It's a scale one dimensional thickness, okay? You can convert that into a volume if you multiply it by the area, which you see here, volumes of water, okay? Uh, and you can also convert the rainfall into a rate. You could see that 15 millimeters across the monsoon, I said. So 15 millimeters across three months. So if you divide the number of days, you can get per day how much is the rate. Normally, the amount of rainfall is given as per day, like every day this millimeters is recorded, or uh, an intensity, which is a rate per hour, or most importantly, you in a national context, you will describe it as a unit per year, okay? because all the water balance components are per year. So you would say 600 millimeters in a arid region in Gujarat per year. If it goes to Maharashtra, for example, along the Western Ghats, you get around 3000 millimeters per year. So this is a thickness. You can convert it into a rate. Uh, all these are dependent on the research you do. So the first point I would like to stress here is, please look into the data and the units. If your units are not the same, you need to convert them before you compare between rainfall, groundwater, industry use, et cetera. If you do not, then it will just not make sense. Okay? The, the additions will not add up. So volumes of water is also present. Uh, you can do it as cubic feet. Also within the units, you, within the rates, depths, and units, you also have different ways of expressing a unit, a dimension. For example, you can tell volume of water in cubic feet, gallons, cubic meters, acre foot, et cetera, et cetera. Acre foot is an area times a thickness, which is a foot, right? So all these things, please go through. Uh, the books I've recommended, uh, have it, but most importantly, when you download the data, the unit would be given. Okay? Discharge is the amount of water which comes in rivers, is a flow unit per uh, time. For example, you, you tell cubic meters per second of speed, the, the velocity of water in the river. So rainfall is in precipitation, comes in as millimeter thickness of water, depth, that converts into runoff as, as, a, as a velocity. So all this, you can still convert it back into volumes. Normally volumes is good. So if you convert rainfall into volume, if you convert discharge into volume, 
you can get into comparing it. Okay, so you can see here cubic feet per second. If you compare that or convert it to per day, then you just multiply the number of seconds per day, and you would get a cubic feet or a cubic volume. Okay, so this is how you convert everything into one unit. As I said, there are multiple units, so please do not get confused uh, of how these units are organized. All hydrological books, most of the good books would have a unit table either in the front or in the appendix. Check it. And you can also get these conversion rates uh, in um, online modes. Okay, so you can look here, uh, you can convert centimeters into inches, just multiply. Okay, so there are two basic units one is metric and one is English units. Because we were under the British rule, we have a confused system that some of the units are still in English and some of it are in metric or SI units as we okay. So most of the world uses the metrics, uh, but some English units are still being used. For example, if you go to a shoe shop in India, you still order by feet, right? Inches and stuff. If you tell your height, it is uh, foot and inches, whereas uh, in other countries, it will be centimeters. Okay, when we when we go for a distance, it's kilometers, not miles. So this confusion does exist. So please, uh, when you do the calculations for water area, uh, etc., please make sure you understand which unit you're using. For example, area we do have hectares and square kilometers. It's a very common term. But you can when you when you look at some irrigation reports, you look at as acres, which is English unit. So you see you need to convert these two units. Otherwise, this calculation will go wrong. Just look at uh, how much difference the decimals it will come. So always convert them and be careful. So that is one uh, very important point I would like to mention before I conclude. Uh, so we talked about the hydrological cycle. We looked about some components in the hydrological cycle before we introduced how much fresh water do we have to conserve. And then we looked into some units. Uh, and uh, before the next class, please go through some of the units to have an understanding because we will be discussing about rates, rates of how water is being used. Thank you.